Thanks so much, Heidi, for that very warm uh, introduction. And thanks so much to Maria, um, my very gracious host, who took me all around the city today, which was wonderful to see all the great things you have going on here in this, in this beautiful place. Um, and I, I thank, you know, thanks to all of you for, for being here this evening. Um, I, I think it's really a, a testament to the center that you've been having this lecture series, these lectures year after year, and hopefully, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of you, this is the first time you've been here, so I think it's great that to see so many people come out um, who, are, who are clearly passionate about Rochester um, and about the issues that we're going to talk about. Um, here tonight. So I'm, I'm really honored to be here and I'm particularly honored to be the um, launch off speaker for the lecture series. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, a little bit about the center um, that we launched and why we launched it and why it might be meaningful to you. So in November 2018, so a little over a year ago, the Brookings Institution launched uh, the NT and the Robert M. Bass Center for Transformative Placemaking. And our mission was to inspire public and private and civic sector leaders to make transformative investments that generate widespread social and economic benefits. So this is really a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is why do we launch this center and why do we think it's important um, and what do we hope to achieve and really, you know, more importantly, why is this relevant to communities like Rochester? So why transformative placemaking? Well, in the first place, while place has always mattered to people and economies, we really recognize that new technologies and demographic trends are altering the demands for place. And that we needed to better understand those demands and what they mean for our communities, both now and in the future. Um, second, we already knew that a lot of these trends were having many positive impacts on communities, but that those benefits aren't being equally distributed. Rather, the knowledge economy is really leaving too many people and places behind. And so with that kind of knowledge, if those market trends and those demographic trends are going to work for more people and places, um, we recognize that you know, civic um, and public sector and private sector leaders need to have transformative investments in place to be a key part of their solution set. So first, new technologies and demographic trends are really altering the demands for place. So, you know, place has, of course, always mattered to people and economies in ways that are constantly shifting and evolving. So if you think back to the 19th century, America's cities grew to become not only centers of commerce and of trade, but really powerhouses of invention and of industry. And then within those cities, the variable needs of artisans, of retailers, of other businesses, of large manufacturing terms, firms, and workers really um, gave, gave, you know, helped determine you know, where those, where those entities clustered um, and really gave rise to our downtown areas as well as our industrial districts. Of course, the demands for place really changed pretty dramatically during the course of the 20th century. So first of all, the advent of the automobile coupled with new infrastructure investments, housing and land use policies, and the changing demands of industry led to the move of people and jobs away from central cities to greener and frankly often whiter suburban pastures, leaving a lot of our communities behind in, in um, decline and in distress. And this changing the relationship then of, between place and economy has really left us with this very these varied patterns of concentration, of dispersion, and of racial and economic segregation that real still, really, frankly, largely still characterize a lot of our cities and our suburbs today. But of course, none of these patterns are static. As with past innovations, today's digital revolution is enabling the creation of new products and services that have the potential to improve our health, our environment, and our overall quality of life. But the digital revolution is also causing some really disruptive impacts on our growth and on our development patterns. So first, the desire for greater collaboration among firms and workers, together with the rise in the sharing economy, is causing higher demand for levels of density and proximity that facilitate interaction and that facilitate exchange of ideas, certainly, but even as well as physical items from housing to transportation to tools. Further, as more shoppers are going online, the country's retail landscape is being pretty dramatically shaken. 
A lot of brick and mortar establishments located in drivable suburban shopping malls are becoming obsolete, while growing e-commerce establishments are exhibiting really mixed patterns of both sprawl and concentration within suburbs and urban areas. And so we know that these trends are going to continue to have a pretty potent impact both on how we shop and in, in some cases where we work as well. And then finally, the rise of flexible and remote work is really changing companies' needs for fixed office space. We don't fully know all the implications of these shifts, but they probably don't bode terribly well for a lot of existing office developments, particularly those that are isolated or that are sort of poorly designed back offices whose purpose is frankly becoming increasingly irrelevant. Meanwhile, the ability of growing numbers of untethered workers to work and to meet where they want um, is you know, giving the rise to co-working and other kind of flexible office spaces and really changing that dynamic of the, of the office environment. Because now as people have choices, um, they, they are often choosing to be in areas that are more dynamic and vibrant and may not, may not be wanting to, to work in some of the more isolated office buildings that really dominated our landscape for a long, long time. So all these disruptions that are being caused by the di digital revolution are occurring in tandem with a pretty powerful demographic revolution that's having its own complementary impacts on place with diversifying, house, uh, diversifying populations, changing household structures, people delaying um, marriage, people having you know, fewer children, are, uh, all these kind of trends. An, an older um, population that's making their own decisions um, on where they want to um, live um, after perhaps they have children that are out of the house. All these things are really driving increased demand for more walkable and more vibrant and dynamic communities in which to live and to work and to recreate. So we know that all these trends, all these market trends, all these demographic trends are really starting to yield a lot of positive impacts on many people and places. And you certainly see that here in, in Rochester, right? I mean, you can look around a lot of your communities, uh, a lot of those that I saw today, your downtown area. And I think places all over the country are starting to see that kind of reinvestment. And um, that's great it, for, for places that have not seen a lot of that growth for a long, long time. Uh, this is having a really positive effect. But we also know that um, even as we're having all these effects, you know, a lot of people in places are getting left behind. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But in the first place, after decades of sprawl and suburban dominance, many cities are experiencing these rebounding populations and growing employment and new kinds of investments. And so what this is, what's happening is we're seeing the revitalization that's leading to new or even revitalized areas of economic activity, particularly in more historic downtowns, along waterfronts, more recently in these innovation districts where you're seeing more innovative firms clustering and connecting, often but not limited to universities and medical centers and other kind of major anchor institutions. So in Rochester, for example, this we did some work, um, Heidi referenced it, a report that we did this summer that looked at changing trends in job density, for example. And so this is what it looks like uh, here in Rochester and where your densest parts of town. I think for those of you who know Rochester well, this probably isn't terribly surprising that you see that highest job density that's concentrated in the downtown and some of the waterfront areas and still along some of the major highway corridors. And so, you know, for cities and for other communities that have suffered from years of job and population loss, these trends are producing some pretty welcome effects. And so, for example, um, what we've demonstrated through some of our work is that job density alone leads to better economic uh, performance. Uh, we found that metro areas that saw increases in job density actually saw faster job growth and GMP growth. Um, than those places that either where des dense job density kind of stagnated or where they were actually losing job density. Uh, we know that dense locations lead to more innovation. Some work by a former colleague of mine, Scott Andes, looking carefully at downtown universities and comparing them to universities that are located in more rural areas or even in very, very suburban areas found actually that um, those universities that are located in more urban kind of environments outpace those non-urban universities on a whole range of innovation indicators, from licensing deals to the number of startups. 
And this probably helps explain why a lot of our more advanced industry firms and entrepreneurs are increasingly moving to kind of be in that orbit, in that gravitational pool of a lot of these institutions. And then finally, Chris Leinberger and his colleagues at George Washington University, actually one of his colleagues who now works for me, Tracy Lowe, um, who did a lot of this work around uh, walkability, have demonstrated that walkable places yield strong premiums in housing, retail, and office rents over those in more drivable sub suburban areas. So not only are they having this rent impact, but that in turn then can obviously have some pretty strong and positive fiscal effects on those places that are regenerating and that are really investing in these kind of walkable urban environments. So, and yet for, for all these positive effects, we also know that the knowledge economy is leaving far too many people and far too many places behind. So in, in the first place, we know that the knowledge economy is favoring tech-oriented workers over those without digital skills. So our research has really shown that workers in highly digital occupations, software developers, uh, financial managers, far out-earn those in kind of low digital occupations. That could be anything from you know, cooks to security guards. I think this, this probably isn't, isn't too terribly surprising. But what we also know then is, okay, not only do you have some occupations that are certainly paying far better than others, it's not terribly equitable in terms of who are actually getting those jobs. So what this really shows is when you look across racial lines, that it's often white populations that are in those high, highly digital, more highly paid occupations um, while compared to the US average, while it's the reverse is true for sort of those low digital, lower, lower wage, lower paid occupations. So not only are a lot of these inequities impacting people, but they're also really dividing places too. So if you look across the country, the digital economy is rewarding large global centers that are attracting innovative companies and highly educated workers, while many of older industrial cities, um, many heartland communities, particularly a lot of small and mid-sized places, are really struggling to keep pace. So just recent research that just came out by one of my colleagues, actually I, there was a big launch event um, or a big event around this paper today, really looked at this across the country showing that there's just five sort of superstar places that are kind of running away with it, um, actually accounting for 90% of all US job growth in the innovation sector. And so this has some pretty powerful impacts when we look across the, cent the, the country of those places that are just seeing so much of the growth and those places that um, are losing, are lo even, even growing places that may be losing relative share. So many of these same trends that are kind of dividing the country are also playing out within regions. And I, I think this will be no surprise here where you see a lot of these same patterns. We certainly see them in places around the country. So this just happens to show that research by the Economic Innovation Group um, that demonstrated that prosperous areas within metros have been adding firms and jobs over time while the other communities that weren't prosperous to begin with, many of those are continuing to face decline in investment. So again, it's a little bit of this winner take most kind of trend that you're seeing across the country, but then even within places where successful places keep seeing that kind of growth and development and the places that um, haven't seen have been declining or have been kind of stagnating are continuing not, you know, often not to see that kind of investment overall. And so what's happening is a lot of these trends are reinforcing or in fact in many times exacerbating those spatial disparities created by the decades of housing and land use policies and practices that devalued, segregated, and sometimes even physically destroyed low income um, and often minority communities. So all this brings me to the third reason that really motivated us to launch this, this Bass Center for Transformative Placemaking. So as I've described, major market and demographic forces are really altering the demands for place, yielding rewards for some people and for some communities. But in this era that we have that's marked by really stark inequalities, by income and wealth, <coughs> by race and ethnicity, by geography, local and regional leaders from big cities to the smallest of towns are really I think hungry, and we're seeing this, you know, very hungry to harness these forces in ways that produce more widespread economic benefits for their people and for their communities. And so that was really a motivating factor for us of recognizing that um, we needed to have some more tools to help bridge some of these gaps and placemaking really being the key part of that. 
So what sets transformative placemaking apart? If you notice, we use this, we put this word transformative in front of uh, this word placemaking. The word placemaking has been sort of around actually for, for quite a long time, for several decades, um, uh, put out there and sort of popularized by groups like Project for Public Spaces. It does a lot of work and has for many decades around, um, uh, around placemaking, particularly in public spaces. But what we're trying to do is be a bit more expansive that, than that in, in several ways. So first of all, when we talk about transformative placemaking, we're really talking about a much broader scope. So this is about investments that are leading not only to high quality or high amenity kind of places where people want to be and where they want to socialize, but it's really to create more regionally significant communities that generate broad-based broad and locally-led prosperity, particularly economic prosperity. So with this kind of broader scope, it really means that we're talking about a broader scale as well. So this is, we're really talking about investments not just in parks or plazas or individual blocks, um, but really in hubs or communities or districts. We actually don't have, to be honest with you, great language around this. Um, districts kind of, I think, captures it maybe in many ways the most. But really that scale where you see economic and physical and social and civic sector assets really clustering and connecting. So in addition to sort of this broader scope and a broader scale for the kind of work that we're talking about, this is really about a, a more integrated approach when we, when we think about transformative placemaking and, and hence the puzzle piece up here that's really um, quite visually trying to get at this idea of integration. And so we've created this framework around transformative placemaking. Um, it's, a, it's on our website if you want to see more. We actually wrote a brief and, and included sort of this one-page document that summarizes kind of our view of, when we talk about transformative placemaking, what is it that we're trying to do? What are we trying to accomplish? What are the outcomes that we want to seek for communities? And so we came up with kind of this framework that we hope others will use, certainly in their own work, but also internally drives the, the work and the research uh, that we're doing um, at the center as well. So the, the, the framework, as you can see, really has four component parts. First of all, it's about helping to nurture an economy that's regionally connected. Um, so this is, again, this is about regional connection um, for residents, making sure that residents are connected to the larger economy and the businesses are connected um, to that larger, to those markets, to those networks, to those jobs, and to economic opportunity. Um, this, but the second piece here, it's regionally connected, it's, you know, it's innovative, meaning these are places that foster, you know, creativity and entrepreneur, entrepreneurship. Um, and then importantly, are rooted in the assets of local residents and businesses. So this isn't just about trying to attract businesses and attract others from outside of the community, but it's really about how you're nurturing and supporting the development of local talent, of local investment, and of local businesses as well. So it's not to say that that attraction piece isn't important, and, and I think when you're doing all this kind of work, that will naturally happen, but it's really trying to um, come at this from the perspective of having places that are really driven by by local businesses, by local people, um, while at the same time understanding and re their role in the regional economy and really connecting back to it. So the second piece is really around the built environment. Um, and this is about supporting a built environment that's at once accessible. So this means providing easy, reliable, affordable, multimodal movement, um, both from, to and from places, but also within them as well. Um, it's flexible. Um, we have a rapidly changing kind of economy and changing dynamic. Um, you need to be creating the kind of physical environment that allows for that adaptability and that flexibility over time. Um, and it in advances community health and resiliency. And when we talk about community health and resiliency, these are places where you want your people to be healthy, your workers to be healthy, but you also want your physical environment, your ecological environment to be healthy as well. So how do you create that kind of built environment um, that allows that, that to happen? The third piece is really around the social environment. Um, this is about fostering those kind of, you know, vibrant places, cohesive places um, that promote social interaction, that promote um, interaction, particularly among diverse uh, populations, um, and uh, residents, workers, business owners, other kind of community members, and that also importantly 
um, reflects the, the community history, the identity, and the culture of those places. So that you're really building places that are socially dynamic, um, that bring people together, but in a way that really cultivates trust and is really you know, true and reflective of the people that were already there while being open um, to, to the people that are moving into an area too um, and, and, constant, and, and constantly sort of promoting that diversity of, of interaction and activity. And then the final piece of, of the puzzle or the framework is really about the civic infrastructure. And this is, you know, how are you encouraging civic infrastructures that are locally organized? Um, so this is really about creating the kind of even governance structures, informal or formal, that are representative of the community, um, that are inclusive, and that ultimately support network building. And so this is really, in some ways, it's an outcome, but it's also a key input into sort of helping all the other levers work and to be able to pull all these other levels, levels of the framework because what we found is in order for communities to be able to um, advocate for themselves and to really articulate their own vision, you need to have that built-in capacity to be able to do that. Um, whether that's in formal ways or even in informal ways or even more kind of formalized governance structures that give people a sustained way to voice what they want from their community and again to be able to advocate for that for those needs ideally in a way that is you know aligned with the, the larger vision of the city as well but absent that kind of organization what we often see and i think you probably see this here i heard some stories you know throughout the day today of we wind up in these kind of more adversarial reactive kind of relationships where you know communities are put in a position that if they haven't had that capacity to be able to kind of work together over time and build trust among themselves and trust among the development development community or among the public sector you wind up in these kind of you know developments are coming or there's a change that's happening and the community is just put in a position to react back to it as opposed to being able to be more reflective and more proactive to be able to articulate what it is that they they want to see from themselves and their community so this is really um, really a key part of the framework and and again importantly these things are all integrated with one another right I mean when we talk about it, uh, the built environment needs to be supportive um, of the kind of economy that you want to see. Clearly, the built environment and creating that kind of dynamic space and, and the infrastructure that businesses need, for example. You want to create a built environment that creates um, a healthy population that then can be productive in the workforce. You want to be creating a social environment that has its own then impacts on creating a stronger business environment because people who are engaged in public spaces you know, maybe then more likely to patronize the businesses that are there. So all these things, it's really hard to, to untangle them, and that's why this place-based lens is so important, because when you look at, at this framework from a place perspective, it allows you to, to better see the connections between all these things and how they're, they're ultimately working together to really fulfill the, the goals and the vision of a particular community. So just a couple examples from around the country. We actually have blog posts on all these, so that's kind of why I picked them out, because we've done, um, actually, we didn't do the writing. We had guest authors from each of these places um, do the writing for us. And so that way, if you want more information, you can go to our website. Um, these are all, actually, we, we launched a what we call our Placemaking Postcards blog series over the summer. And it was really just a way so that we could hear and, you know, and. 1,000, 1,100 words, hear stories from around the country and the voice from, um, from those places. So if any of, you, any of you have great placemaking stories that you want to tell, please get in touch with me because we're always looking for, for new content. We put something out usually about every three weeks or so. Um, and it, it's been kind of gratifying to see how many people, we weren't sure if we'd struggle you know, to find people to, to, who wanted to write. But um, it's been great because I think everybody you know, who are doing great things out there want to tell their story and it's great then for the audience, um, for, the people, for the people reading it to, to be able to say, wow, that's a really interesting idea. Maybe it's something that's, that can apply to my community. So I'm just going to briefly talk about you know, some of the examples that, that, um, that we've been profiling. Um, this could sort of fit in each part of the framework. So in Wytheville, Virginia, this is actually a small place um, in Virginia, They've really you know, focused on this local entrepreneurship piece by investing in their main street, inv investing in that physical environment, certainly in the placemaking in that environment, but also really um, investing in their local businesses. 
um, providing things like access to capital, um, offering classes and kind of technical assistance, mentoring networking opportunities, and they actually even launched a, comp a business competition that um, allowed local businesses to sort of apply for um, a grant and, and less expensive space in Main Street um, and found that that was really successful. So it's you know, one example of the kind of ways that you can be thinking about you know, growing small businesses by providing those supports um, in, in a particular community. Um, Memphis Riverfront Parks is sort of a good built environment um, uh, kind of example. Um, increasing connectivity between neighborhoods, that's really been a lot of their focus. Um, this is, you know, Memphis is a community that has a lot of uh, historic, you know, racial and economic segregation. So they've really been focused on how do they, how can they really invest in their riverfront parks to help bridge a lot of those gaps um, by defining pedestrian cycling corridors along the river that really connect. And I think that's something that's certainly relevant here with your um, with your riverfront initiatives, your your Rock the Riverfront um, of really how do you you know how do you build out these kind of this kind of connective tissue that allows communities to access the water um, and uh, and to access each other too along along the waterway. And that's something they've been certainly focused on. Um, and they've also used this park as really an anchor for neighborhood investment. People like to be near green spaces and parks and have this kind of amenity. Um, at the same time, they've also used this through their, their own initiatives to foster things like workforce development um, by looking at, you know, as they're maintaining these parks and as they're building them out, they were hiring, you know, people to do that work, to do the landscaping and um, other types of maintenance work and realizing that there was a real opportunity to build the workforce in their own community um, towards these ends. Um, University City District in Philadelphia, when we talk about this kind of social um, and how you're creating these social and, and more inclusive and diverse spaces, um, this is an organization that does a lot of public space investment, a lot of public space management and programming. They were realizing though that even though they do a lot of their work in West Philadelphia and in the University City area, that they were seeing a lack of diversity in terms of a lot of these public spaces. And so they really did a real evaluation and sort of questioning themselves of who's using our spaces and who's not using them and why aren't they here? Is this about the space? Is it connect, if people can't connect to them? People feel uncomfortable in them, they don't feel welcome. Are we not creating the right kind of programming to bring people from the neighborhoods um, together and diverse groups of people together? So now they're really tracking who's utilizing those spaces and trying to use that to drive their investment decisions moving forward. And then finally on, on kind of the civic engagement component, um, a great example is the 11th Street Bridge Park in Washington, DC. Um, they've, th you know, this is a bridge park. It's actually a bridge across the Anacostia River connecting Anacostia to Capitol Hill, two very different neighborhoods in terms of um, demographics and income levels. And so this project, you know, started as both a, you know, a bridge in the truest sense of creating, you know, this park across a bridge, um, but also bridging communities together. And so the work that they've done has been really focused on this kind of civic engagement. They've conducted hundreds of meetings on both sides of the river. Um, they've offered community leadership courses to really help build that kind of civic capacity um, and empowerment and through workshops and, and other things, um, providing direct resources for the communities to be able to develop their own plans and kind of set, set their own vision and their own goals. Um, and really, you know, all around just trying to be very attentive to the existing residents and what they need and what they want out of this new park development. So, in terms of um, this, this work around transformative placemaking, um, you know, we're, what we're trying to do at, at Brookings is really get, get, get this idea and this framework out. Um, at the same time, we're constantly learning from communities that, that help us um, you know, do our research, ask and try to answer some of the right questions, and communicate it um, back outward to communities. And you know, what we fundamentally realize is that to do this transformative placemaking, um, this is a long-term you know, endeavor. It's a long-term endeavor for us, hopefully, if we can continue to get funding to run the center, um, but obviously in communities itself. But it really you know, requires um, to, to deliver these outcomes, new knowledge, new practices and tools, and new policies and investment strategies that ultimately better support place-like development. So first of all, transformative placemaking requires new knowledge. So it's trying to answer questions like, 
where are our economic and our physical and our social and our civic assets already clustered? Where are they clustered now? Um, and where are they clustered in ways that have not been necessarily recognized or valued by the marketplace or even by the public sector? What's the spatial geography of your, of your economy um, at a regional scale, at a city scale? Um, often this is, you know, this is sort of the starting place. If we're gonna talk about transformative placemaking in places, what are the places that actually have that kind of baseline of assets where transformative placemaking really has potential to take hold? Um, what are the varied and, and very unique roles that these kind of hubs or these districts play in the regional economy? Um, you know, not every, every, you know, every community, every place connects to the regional economy in very different ways in terms of the kind of business activities that happen there, in terms of the, um, how they're tapping into the larger marketplace, who comes there, why are they coming? And so these are the kind of questions that not every place is the same within a city, within a region, and really understanding those varied roles is obviously really important to understanding the kind of investment strategies um, that you want to be making in those places so that you're really helping places overcome their challenges but also leverage their assets. And so um, once you have this kind of information, it should really drive then how you're prioritizing economic development investments, infrastructure investments, and placemaking investments. Um, not just at a city scale, but really at a, at a regional scale so that you're setting that platform um, to be making the kind of you know, land use decisions, economic development decisions, infrastructure decisions that can really help set the platform to, to um, ultimately experience the kind of transformative placemaking outcomes that you want to see. So um, we need whole new sets of policies and investment strategies. We've been building the same way in this country for a pretty long time um, when we think about our sprawling development patterns. And that's really been supported by land use policies, housing policies um, that have really prioritized auto-centric development and sprawl over more investment in our existing places, whether they're in the cities or whether they're in the suburbs. So for example, I showed you that slide of Rochester showing you where your densest areas were. Um, but in fact, when we look at change over time, uh, which we did for metros across the country, Rochester is a place that is not densifying. In fact, it's moving in the opposite direction. So this is a place that when it comes to jobs, um, is still continuing to, to sprawl outward. So even as you have a fairly, you know, a, a low growth from a population standpoint, um, city, uh, fairly slow growing metro area, um, even, even as growth is not rampant, you're still seeing physical growth um, sprawling outwards. And so if we're going to talk about transformative placemaking, it may be time to reevaluate a lot of the outmoded land use policies, um, economic development, infrastructure investments, all those sorts of things that are continuing to fil facilitate that outward movement as opposed to prioritizing places that already have existing, um, are existing hubs in your, in your economy. So once we under, you know, we're talking about revamping those policies, but um, from an economic, economic standpoint, land use standpoint, it's also about transportation investments. So how can we be rethinking transportation investments to be targeted to creating more walkable, more, more bikeable, and overall just more connected hubs and districts? And the same for economic development investments, to be more intentional and a lot less reactive to the latest new windfall opportunity. And, and this comes, again, stems back to understanding what the geography of your economy is and how that can be supported through economic development inv investments. What we often tend to see is sort of a bit of, um, of being spatially agnostic when it comes to the economy. And many communities, um, particularly those that are competing with each other for tax bases, just grabbing onto any, any opportunity, particularly for areas that have not seen a ton of growth. And so this is how we get, you know, investing, you know, giving incentives to individual businesses, for example, instead of thinking more holistic, holistically about where those businesses might be located or the kind of um, investing in local businesses that already exist or helping them scale. Um, it's about grabbing onto the next new, you know, state tax incentive or federal incentive, you know, everything from empowerment zones in their day to opportunity zones or what have you, being, again, reactive without really having a plan, an economic de development plan or vision for what you want your city, what you want your region to really become. What do you do well? What are your competitive advantages? How do you capitalize on those? 
So transformative placemaking um, then finally requires new practices and tools. So once you sort of are, are making those, um, thinking, looking at, at the city, looking at the region more broadly to understand what is that geography of our economy? Where, you know, where are our assets located? Where are our hubs of activity? How do we start to think differently about our policies and investment strategies towards those ends? What happens once you're in the places? And that's really our, the framework is really about the places themselves and how you how you focus on those four pieces of the framework to create these you know inclusive, connected, vibrant places. But we need more tools to do that, right? So how do you adapt? How do you design new places within places that help that help um, meet these outcomes? And then how do you build that capacity? Again, coming back to the governance. How do you build the governance organizations that really help um, set, the, set the vision, set goals, and really sustain them over long periods of time? Because this is not easy work. It takes a long time. So how do you create the capacity on the ground to be able to, be able to do this? So um, again, that's what we're, all, we're you know, trying to focus on uh, at the Bass Center, certainly. It's, that's why it's a, you know, it's a great opportunity for me to come to places like Rochester to, to be able to go through your, your communities, see your neighborhoods, um, see the, the interesting things that are happening, seeing, seeing where some of the challenges are, talking to folks like Maria and others, because this is how we learn as well, and that's a lot of how we do our work, um, is to understand what's happening around the country so that we can know, one, how we start, you know, what questions should we be prioritizing in terms of our own research? Um, what are you know? What are the pain points for communities? What do they want to? What do they need to know that maybe we can um, we can help? Whether that's you know understanding trends um, that might impact them to understanding you know policy change and who's doing things well. Um, how do we start to think differently about that policy dynamic? And certainly constantly looking for those kind of. Um, placemaking practices that are working. We're doing a lot around even measuring. How do we measure them so that we actually know what's working and can put some metrics? Because we ultimately want to be continuing to make the case for why this is so important and why it's why transformative placemaking is the better path. But we also want to help places understand where that potential lies and then actually how they can do it in their own communities. So. Um, with that, I know we'll have a little bit of time for questions, but thank you again so much for having me here this evening. It's been a pleasure.